Good afternoon, uh, guys. So we're here to look at two men in The Handmaid's Tale, the two lovers of Offred, Luke and Nick. And my major title is, is this a triumphant assertion of love or is it the disturbing dependency on men? And I think that that's a difficult question to answer. So what will we look at? We're going to look at Luke as a very ambiguous figure. In many ways, we'll see him as a new man, having the qualities of a progressive man. In other ways, I think we might be a little bit more suspicious of him. I think we've already started talking about elements of second wave feminism, and we'll see how having that critical perspective will help your interpretations. We'll look at this idea as is offered a subordinate wife and a subordinate lover. And we'll look at Nick as a kind of postmodern figure. It's going to be really interesting because we, re we really don't know who Nick is. And even by the end of the book, that's the case. And we'll look at the role of love and sexuality in dystopian literature. Dystopian literature famously often suggests that love cannot exist in that kind of totalitarian society. Okay, and we'll examine whether that's true. Now, first of all, um, I'm using Luke from the TV series here. I don't really like um, this version of Luke. Uh, to be honest with you, I think the racial element is, is very interesting because The Handmaid's Tale makes it very clear that Gilead is a white supremacist republic. And I think that that seems to be lost in the TV series, okay? So I don't imagine Luke as being black um, uh, or mixed race. And I think that that's quite important. The other symbolism I'm using here, I hope you realize why, is of course Offred meets Luke in hotel rooms. She is his mistress for a long time while he's married to somebody else. In fact, it's such a wonderful and remarkable moment in the novel when she gets taken to Jezebel's dressed as, you know, some kind of whore, that she recognizes it's the hotel that her husband took her to. Now that's no coincidence. Atwood is playing with the reader there and suggesting all kinds of things. So we'll have a quick look at that. And I'm going to be looking at this thing as to what extent can we see Luke and the commander as parallel figures? Is that a radical reading or is that actually quite a strong reading? Well, I'm going to start off with that straight away. I think on a small level it's worth looking at the whole issue of mansplaining, isn't it? Okay, I'm using a modern neologism. But I think you'll notice that both the commander and Luke enjoy mansplaining to uh, offer it, do they not? Yeah? And here in this particular slide, we'll see that we have Luke saying, fraternize means to behave like a brother. Okay? There is no word, he tells her, for to behave like a sister. He said it would be sororize. Um, he seemed to know such curious usages. I used to tease him about being a pedant. Well, not only are you going to connect to Luke there, but you're also going to connect to Professor Piaxotto. Is that how we pronounce it? I always wonder, is it Pixiotto or Piaxotto? I don't know. Okay. All three of these men kind of form a triangle then, don't they? Of mansplaining. And Latin, of course, is the language of male classical learning. When we taught um, George Eliot a few years back, and Mr. Anderson will remember this, one of the key things in the mill of the floss, sir, do you remember, is that Maggie was unable to learn Latin, even though she was brilliant at it. Only her brother had Latin classes. So I'm going to suggest that Latin is actually symbolic of the male preservation of knowledge. And that's why it's kind of quite interesting that Pixiotto is going to go back to Latin and to show it case his classical learning later, okay? Of course, the commander, above all people, loves his Latin. And when she asks him about the quotation on Nolite, um, uh, he enjoys this moment. At first, he doesn't recognize it, does he? Okay? And then he says, you know how schoolboys are? You'll notice a huge parallel again with Pixiotto when he says historical wags, historical jokers. In both cases, there's this kind of very patriarchal, uh, snooty, patrician humor based upon their elite education, etc. 
and he tells her about this quotation, does he not? And he explains to her that it's actually schoolboy Latin. And he kind of makes a joke of it. Once again, I want you to think, it's almost like a foreshadowing what's going to happen in the historical notes. Because, of course, that saying means so much, not only to offer it, but to the handmaiden before her. If you're doing an essay on resistance, this is a key quote, is it not? And the fact that it's in Latin, I think, gives her strength, because it's about the appropriation of male discourse. And if you went to a good old-fashioned school like I did, then you would have had a, a Latin motto as being what guides you in life. This is her appropriating a male Latin motto and using it to formulate resistance in her mind. Now, we're moving on. There's this idea of solidification. It's an image cluster that goes throughout the book. We have ideas of transparency. Do you remember this? Of not feeling solid. Um, it is a regular lay motif that goes throughout the book, okay? And what's quite interesting here is here she's lying in the hotel room. She's a mistress, isn't she? And she says, I was still imaginary for him. You can read this in lots of different ways. Does this mean that she was just subordinate for him? I don't think it's a very empowering image of her, do you guys? She seems quite weak at the time, doesn't she? She seems incredibly reliant upon him. Here she is getting herself ready with her perfume, etc. Her red and gold bottle of perfume again, suggesting kind of sexual allure and being a mistress, etc. The knock would come at the door. I'd open with relief, desire. It's going to remind us a little bit of Nick again, isn't it? Yeah. So again, if we're thinking about, say, someone like Offred's mother, second wave feminist, they may judge Offred quite cruelly here, don't you think? and suggests that she's actually taking on a very subordinate um, status. She says, how were we to know that we were happy? Well, she's speaking for the we there, but waited alone, didn't she, again? And again, I don't have to tell you about those uncomfortable parallels of the fact that that is the very hotel that she's going to be with with command later. So our question is, is Luke the new man? Okay. We know that he likes cooking but he also likes to make quite a lot of biologically essentialist claims about men and meat and masculinity, etc. Now, are they jokes or not? Well, the first thing is that Margaret Atwood doesn't like creating very clear characters. Like a lot of postmodern writers, they're very ambiguous characters. We can read them in many different ways, and we don't necessarily trust our focalizer offer, do we? She's not always reliable, and we can see gaps in the way that she narrates, okay? So Luke does adopt these essentialist positions, and we know that Offred's mother would certainly not approve of the role that Offred has taken both in her relationship and later her affair with Nick, okay? But is this humour or gender socialism, uh, essentialism, okay? Nick says, men needed more meat than women did. And it wasn't a superstition, and he wasn't being a jerk. Studies had been done. Wow. Here we have a very male form of knowledge, don't you think? Studies, research. Who does that sound like? Professor Pixiotto later, and this idea of patriarchal discourse, and using science, and using the kind of whole domain of facts to actually back a kind of position that suits you. Well, we can read this in different ways, can't we? We can read it as quite a funny joke, taking the mickey out of the mother, who is very super uptight, isn't she? Yeah? Or do we see this taken together with other evidence that Luke does have actually some patriarchal traits? Okay. This is where he liked to choose the meat, isn't it? Okay. Um, now, moving on to Offred's mother, okay. We know that Offred's mother could be criticised for a kind of misandry, the opposite of misogyny. She seems to often make incredible generalisations about men. She seems to dislike men. So we could see her as a kind of parody, couldn't we, of second wave feminism, yeah? 
But I'm going to suggest later that there's actually there's some really fine characteristics to her as well. Uh, most notably, the fact that she is very brave in her rebellion, is she not? Yeah. Now, when she sees Nick cooking, she actually says, "Don't you know how many women's lives, how many women's bodies, the tanks had to roll over just to get this far?" And what does Luke say? Cooking's my hobby. Hobby, schmobby, my mother would say. You don't have to make excuses to me. Once upon a time, you wouldn't have been allowed to have such a hobby. They'd have called you queer. It's almost like she is nostalgic for that world of gender polarities. One of the things I want to point out to you is that the genius of this book is that Margaret Atwood displays the fact that right-wing Christian evangelical thinking shares a little bit with radical feminism, don't you think? Pornography is terrible, God, woman from these evil men who just want to violate them sexually, etc. Don't they sound quite reminiscent of fundamentalist Christianity? And isn't it really telling that Offred's mother burns pornography in the park, shoulder to shoulder with evangelical right-wing Christians? Do they share some of this kind of bigotry, some of this dogmatism, some of this zeal? And now on to second wave uh, feminism. Andrea Dworkin is once again popular thanks to our President Donald Trump. Um, uh, she says some really interesting things here, and I've just picked out three quotes. Feminism is hated because women are hated. Doesn't that sound like Offred's mother? One of the things about Alfred's mother is we could sort of laugh a little bit about uh, at her for being extreme, but she was right, and Gilead came, and who predicted it? Alfred's mother predicted it, didn't she? Um, notice this, while gossip among women is universally ridiculed, you would like this, guys, for Duffy, for the Long Queen, okay? It's ridiculed as low and trivial. Gossip among men, especially if it's about women, is called theory. Wonderful quote to have for the historical notes, I feel, yeah? Don't you? Seduction, and this is my favorite of all, is often difficult to distinguish from rape. Very witty, this. In seduction, the rapist often bothers to buy a bottle of wine. Uh, in the case of the commander and Jezebel's, that quote actually rings entirely true, doesn't it? Okay. Now, this is certainly the language of uh, Offred's mother, isn't it? Okay. Now, how are we going to apply this to, uh, to Offred? Because her marriage to Luke, in many ways, could be seen as a kind of heterosexual bliss, couldn't it? Uh, lying in the bed with Luke, his hand on my rounded belly, she says, look, the thunderstorm outside the window, Sounds a bit like the uh, genre of romance, don't you feel? Um, I'm not frightened, we're awake, the rain hits now, we will be slow and careful. Okay, so they're making love while she's pregnant, it's this kind of incredible nostalgic image she has. It almost reads like something out of the pages of Mills and Boons, doesn't it? Okay, and then she goes on to say, if I thought this would never happen again, I would die. Now, it's interesting because Dworkin and um, more radical second wave feminists were very suspicious of love and basically saw it as a male a patriarchal ideology to enslave women. Now, Offred certainly doesn't take that position. She is a believer in romance, in love, and she defends heterosexuality. In more radical elements, like you've seen in second wave feminism, the position that someone like Dworkin would take would be that only lesbianism can actually be a good thing in a woman's life because men and women will always be uh, an unfair, coercive relationship, okay? That's certainly not the position offered is taking, is it, okay? However, as I said to you, it's not all rosy because when Offred looks back, and she's talking about the formation of Gilead in the dark days of the formation. When she has her uh, compu bank account closed down, do you remember? And her compu card doesn't work, etc. And she loses her job. 
and she feels that society is changing and she understands that she's going to have to have this incredibly restricted role as the kind of domestic angel, which is what Gilead is looking for, she kind of has a sneaking suspicion that Luke likes it and that he will enjoy being the protector, okay? He kissed me then, as if now I would said that, things could get back to normal. A little bit of a patronizing kiss, a bit reminiscent of the commander, do you feel? Yeah? And his little scrabble kiss as well. And she thinks to herself, he doesn't mind this. He doesn't mind it at all. Maybe he even likes it. We are not each other's anymore. Instead, I am his. Well, doesn't offer it sound like a second wave feminist now, don't you think? Again, deeply suspicious of this relationship and the notion that woman will always be the subject. Um, she will be subjected and, the, and to the control of men within heterosexual relationships. Now, there are two ways of reading this, and I always want you to remember. Offred is our focalizer. It may be a moment of paranoia, given the stress of Gilead, seeing her life disintegrate. But there may be something there. Is there an answer? No. So you want to know what AO5 is? That is what AO5 is. Not finding a word in a text and swagging it in different ways. What really AO5 is, of course, is that you can interpret the book and vast chunks of it and read it in different ways. And that's what AO5 truly means, okay? Different readings. Now, what's really interesting, and I'm sure you've all noticed this, is some of the debate between these two men is about merging them, merging Nick and Luke. And of course, Offred does this, and she does this on two or three occasions. And she actually uses it to um, kind of confirm and yet attack the fact that the commander says that women can't add up. Do you remember when he says one and one to woman, one and one isn't two? And she says later, actually, he was right. One and one is one and one. It's not two. And what she's talking about then is, is she going to have these guys as separate or is she going to merge them together? And why would she merge them together? Well, what's quite interesting here is Nick is here. I was coming to find you, he says, breathes almost in my ear. I want to reach up, taste his skin. He makes me feel hungry. Wow. Is this another occasion when Offred is waiting in the hotel room for some man to service her and she's subordinate? Well, you could say that. You could say that. I don't think it's a very interesting reading, though. What I like is that desire has become criminalized in Gilead. And in patriarchal thought, women's desire has often been erased. I think I've told my class before that in Oxford University up until the 1930s they taught, am I allowed to say this on camera, that women couldn't have orgasms, that female desire was a fiction, okay? And that, you know, sexuality was for men. Isn't that something that Gilead has said? Well, I'd like to say, look, I want to reach up, taste his skin, he makes me hungry. How about the fact that this makes a man a sexual object? And we could also say an object of a female gaze as opposed to the woman always being looked at and objectified in this particular way. And it's assertion that in Offred's life, she needs sexuality and sensuality, that it's essential to her. And this is why she cannot exist in Gilead. Seen thus, it becomes quite a humanist thing. It rehabilitates the value of love. It speaks to the second wave feminists who say these relationships are always unequal. And it validates the human need for these kind of relationships. All right, I'm now going to move over to Nick and ask this question. Lover or betrayer? Something that we don't really know 
until the end. And I'm also going to be looking at this idea as, are we looking at a positive portrayal of human contact? Or are we looking at a dark addiction to love and sexuality? If you think about the Duffy poem, Beautiful, you'll remember that Helen of Troy is in the arm, in the brawny arms, do you remember, of Paris? With her cries, so she's having a great time sexually. But if you think about that image, she's trapped. Do you remember? And in the end, the bird, the, uh, the maid keeps a little bird, do you remember, in a cage? And what is that if not a metaphor for Helen? Okay. So again, I see a really interesting connection here. Do we want to see Ofra then as a victim of her desire, as a victim of her need for men, etc.? Here's Nick now. Okay. I put this picture up because the Nick from the former film was very poor. I think it's interesting that Nick is definitely a guy straight out of romance, don't you? Dark Gallic face. Do you remember that? And everything moody, isn't he? He's the moody, dark dude. We can't read him. He's kind of quite Byronic, isn't he? And there's always something a little bit troubling about the man out of romance. We know from, say, Fifty Shades of Grey. Because the female fantasy is often of being incredibly oppressed, both sexually, emotionally, financially. And we'll be asking this question is, does Nick fall into this archetype, do you feel, or not? Now, classically, we first meet Nick when he gives her a little bit of a wolf whistle. Now, as most of you here are girls, I'm sure that if you left this room and someone wolf whistled you, you wouldn't particularly appreciate it. It would be really within the semiotics of male oppression, wouldn't it? You're a sexual object. I'm reducing you to flesh. I'm controlling you. But is that the way the wolf whistle works here? Yeah. I don't think so. Because within the context of Gilead, where we're told all flesh is weak, all flesh is grass, one of my favorite quotes from the Bible, it seems to be the case that what's happening is sensual and sexual desire itself has become criminalized. And Offred, we know, seems to almost welcome the wolf whistle. How could that be? Well, at least someone is seeing her, is what she says, isn't it? When the commander has sex with her, he doesn't see an instrument of pleasure. He sees a womb to fill, doesn't he? And at least she becomes a kind of corporeal being. By this I mean a being of flesh. What's the problem with Gilead? It goes back to what feminists have said in the Bible, that only good woman is an angel, a bodiless woman, a woman without physicality, etc. What does Nick do? He sees her as a woman of flesh again, doesn't he? And within Gilead, that's almost welcome to her. Virginia Woolf is an amazing feminist. A feminist before second wave feminism who was very interested in women's writing and women's voice in particular. I recommend you have a little look at her and find out a bit more about her advice. Kill the angel, she said. She wanted the angel and woman's fiction to be killed above all things. Okay, so that's people like Serena Joy, isn't it? It's okay. Why did she want the angel killed? Because once again, the angel imposed impossible standards on women spiritually. It took away their bodies. It took away sexuality. It took away sin. It took away ambition. And it was so incredibly restrictive. Why am I talking about this? Well, it's going to be very important for the characterization of the relationship between Alfred and Nick. Now, certainly when we're talking about Nick, then the postmodern elements of the novel kick in. What are these postmodern elements? Fragmentation, confusion on the part of the reader, an unreliable narrator, metafiction. That means I'm only telling a story, you know, where you highlight the fictionality of it. 
They're competing narratives, and this is going to be very important with Nick. And there is a lot of explicit pastiche. Pastiche is when you copy a writer and you make that copying very, very obvious. Okay, and postmodernism uses a lot of pastiche when you take bits. Modernism is often about being very creative, and postmodernism is about stealing and plagiarizing. Okay. Now we know, interestingly, that there are three versions of the lovemaking. This is very, very confusing, isn't it? Now there may be different reasons for why Nick and the lovemaking is described in three different ways. One, we could see that Offred's narration kind of screens Nick from us. We don't really get to know Nick, do we? We've got these three competing versions. We don't know which one is right, okay? And we'll see that go right the way through. He's our problem character, isn't he? Our dark stranger. He's almost kind of faceless. We don't really know who he is, okay? Alternatively, you could see it as allowing Offra to have a form of privacy, don't you think? So that when she makes love to him the first time, she can almost pull the curtain down, don't you think? Uh, wonderfully, in Samuel Richardson's novel, uh, Pabla, when they go to bed to make love the first time, he draws a curtain. He says, and now my narrative will stop with the curtain, you know. Is, in a sense, is Offred doing that to us, screening us from this moment of privacy and intimacy which she doesn't want to share with us. Okay. I think this is a very interesting one, though. All versions are true. Postmodernism doesn't believe in a kind of a uni world, a one thing world. It believes in a plural world. Multiple narratives, multiple truths. What was true then, maybe not true now. Okay. And we'll see again, there's lots of like playful pastiche, which is the element of postmodernism I told you about. Okay. Here's one version. The no heroics version, which is the love and dystopia idea. Remember, it's a feature of dystopian, and for AO4, for intertextuality, you don't have to name books, but you need to talk about generic features. Do you remember this? And I may do another lecture on utopia and dystopia, because it would be very useful for you to know about 1984, Brave New World, Zamyatin's We. It's a huge um, genre of fiction at the moment, okay? Come on, he says, we don't have much time. With his arm around my shoulders, he leads me over to the fold of out bed. Not very romantic, is it? The fold out bed even lies me down, okay? He begins to unbutton, then to stroke, kisses beside my ear. So it doesn't really sound like very beautiful foreplay, does it? And look at the pace of the syntax. It's quick, isn't it? There's nothing lingering or sensual about it. It's utilitarian. It's what she gets with the commander, essentially, isn't it? Um, and just to add insult to injury, he goes, no romance, in case you haven't realized. Um, that, that would have meant something else once. Once it would have meant no strings. Now it means no heroics. It means don't risk yourself for me if it should come to it. And so it goes on. So that's the functional side. And the one thing about Nick is he functions, doesn't he? He's a driver. He's a member of the eyes, isn't he? He drives the commander to Jezebel's. He is a survivor, isn't he? He's the opposite of Moira. In a way, it's unfair to compare him to uh, Moira because gender makes them so different, okay? But Nick is an absolute survivor. He's an archetype of dystopian fiction. He will survive anywhere, won't he? So is he just this kind of brass practical opportunist? Well, here's another version, the romantic bliss version. No preliminaries, it all begins the same, yeah? But look what happens to the language. He's undoing my dress. A man made of darkness. Where's that come from? <coughs> Straight out of Mills and Boons, don't you think? For those of you who don't know, Mills and Boons, uh, Mr. Anderson has a passion for them, I believe, sir. Uh, beautiful romance novels uh, that are filled with archetypes 
Uh, nobody ever has boring love making. The earth moves for everybody, and there's always a thunderstorm outside, isn't there? Okay. And listen to this. His mouth is on me, his hands I can't wait, and he's moving. Love. Just now the eagerness and the passion and everything comes out, okay? Does it seem real? Or is she playing? I would say again. Little playful pastiche of Mills and Boots, okay? Going back there. I made it up. That's classic postmodernism. Hey guys, anyone who can remember Atonement, I'm just going to destroy the novel for you right at the end and say I made it all up, okay? It's a characteristic of postmodernism, isn't it? Of this whole idea of metafiction, okay? Here's what happened. Well, yeah, we don't believe we don't believe you anymore. That ellipsis says it all, doesn't it? The reader is going to be left in a state of confusion. What do we do with Nick? We don't really know. All right, now Offred as focalizer. It's so important, guys, for AO2 form. Yeah, always. Remember form, I'm the worst drawer in the world. Can you tell what that is? It's her eye, okay? It actually looks like a small pick, doesn't it? But let's just do that again. So that's her eye, and she's looking at us now, okay? When we're talking about the focalizer, we're talking about whose eyes are we looking through, or, as Mr. Anderson likes to put it, who owns the words? Whose words are they? Okay. Um, we'll have to be fast, says Nick. The context for this, guys, <coughs> is when they go to Jezebel's, and she feels like a betraying slut, doesn't she? Because she's with the man that she loves, and the man that she loves is taking her to be the prostitute of the man that she is serving. She feels humiliated by it, doesn't she? Interesting position for Nick. Why do we feel no sympathy for Nick? Why do we not care about Nick? We never get any interiority from Nick, do we? So Margaret Atwood gives all the interiority to Offred, and Nick remains a mystery, does he not? Okay. If you were doing an essay on men as victims, you might want to think of this moment, of the humiliation that Nick feels, this incredibly demasculating moment for him. We don't care, though, do we? Because we don't share his pain, do we? We share off his bank. So Nick's looking at her now, and she says, he sees me. Is it contempt, I read, or indifference? Is this merely what he expected of me? Do we trust what she says? Is Nick really looking at her like that? We simply don't know, do we? He says nothing. He's a very silent and mysterious character. It may be humiliation. It may be many things. But what Offred is doing is she's projecting her guilt, isn't she? And her passivity and her inability to resist onto Nick. And she's imagining that Nick is judging her in this particular way. <coughs> but once again, there's no evidence that this is in fact the case. Now, moving on to the whole idea of love and memory, which we see with both Luke and Nick, but for the purpose of this short lecture, I'm going to look at Nick. I want to see what can be seen of him, to take him in, memorize him. Interesting one, isn't it? It's something she tries to do with Luke as well, memorize him go over each and every item of his being. Very important for one of our themes here, which is the past and memory, which is something that you should all study for your comparisons, isn't it, yeah? And she's memorizing him here, and she's saying that she wants to save him, like an image, doesn't she? The lines of his body, the texture of his flesh, the glisten of sweat on his pelt, the, his long, sardonic, unrevealing face. The two things I want to point out here. It's always unrevealing with Nick, isn't it? He always makes it hard for us to read him. We share her confusion. 
And this love is very different from links in some ways. Because when you love somebody in a dictatorship, and the book that I think you should have a look at would be 1984, because Margaret Atwood says that that's the biggest influence on her, and she read it as a small girl, I think she was 12 or 13 when she started reading it. In dystopian fiction, in totalitarian societies, love is so difficult because there is no trust. And you can't know people. In a sense, we could see Nick as a survivor who doesn't articulate his emotions. He's very masculine in that sense, isn't he? So that's one element that's very interesting here, and it reminds me of 1984, Winston Smith, who falls in love, and also the relationship can't come to fruition. It's like dictatorship destroys love, and you live in a kind of post-love world. But another way of looking at it is to see Nick as, again, a male object. And that this, once again, is a kind of female gaze. And it reminds us of female desire, doesn't it? And it articulates and legitimates female desire. Would be a different way of interpreting this. And now we get to the last scene, okay. It's interesting that right until the last scene, we still don't know Nick, and neither does she. She has actually risked so much. She's been sneaking out to his bedroom at night, hasn't she? They've become reckless in their love affair. She almost wants to be caught, okay? So you would think under those circumstances she would have some kind of trust in him. But right to the last, when she's about to be caught, when she's about to be discovered and presumably tortured or sent to the colonies. It's Nick who opens the door and she sees Nick and she says, Nick the private eye. See the big eye over there? So all of the time within this kind of surveillance culture, this is a big uh, thing in the news at the moment, isn't it, Mr. Anderson? Surveillance capitalism. No longer late capitalism, surveillance capitalism. Margaret Atwood understood that surveillance would be so powerful, the most powerful of all tools in dictatorships here. Yeah. She says, dirty work is done by dirty people. Now, it's a feature of the book that we have to experience the novel in real time. Later we find, don't we, as I explained in my last lecture, that the entire thing is composed in retrospect, isn't it? It's a recollection. But that's not the way we read it. We read it in real time, don't we? And for this to be effective, we have to read it in real time. Dirty work is done by dirty people. It's almost like we're looking through Opera's eyes and we're looking at Nick. What do we see him as now? The betraying bastard, don't we? Mercenary figure. This is almost like you know, what the French call film noir, which translates obviously as black film, but means really that everybody was manipulating you all of the time. It's almost like a kind of paranoid genre, isn't it? And then you, I can't say on YouTube, I open my mouth to say it, but he comes over close to me and whispers, it's all right, it's Mayday, go with them. He calls me by my real name, which we never find out, but we presume it's Jude. Why should this mean anything? Why indeed? Well, it's a very significant moment, isn't it? It's almost like by calling her by her name, he's trying to show his true love and to say, I am beyond this kind of regime. That, ironically, is far more intimate than making love in this society. And that's what he says to her to kind of touch her and give her belief in him. Now, of course, none of these people existed. I hope you realise that. It was only just a story. But we do kind of think in the way that if she survived to make the tapes, it does seem that Nick wasn't denied them. 
Fair enough. We must have made the mistake of treating them by real characters, but that is, seems to be the way that we think. So what do we make of this last scene? What's the value of it? The value of it seems to me to be that it actually reaffirms love, don't you feel? Because if this is true, then Nick is risking everything for her. He's not just a using guy who had a bit of sex in this dictatorship, is he? He's someone who put his life on the line for her. And let's not forget, he will be left behind. So, is this a triumphant assertion of love? Is The Handmaid's Tale a humanist book that wants to tell us that human beings can behave magnificently and triumphantly? And it's not just all dark and people being kicked to death and being hung from walls, etc. These are questions I can't ask, answer for you, but they're ones that you need to pose in your essays as you write about the whole architecture of the book and its meaning. So to conclude, Atwood makes Nick the hardest figure to judge, as we've seen. Uh, the nature of the totalitarian state is that trust is eroded. I think we've dealt with that, haven't we? It's so hard to love within that context. If we look from a second wave feminist point of view, we can see Offred as weak and as addicted to love. It is a reading. But I would say that there's more to it than that. Clearly, uh, Offred loved Nick, uh, I'm sorry, Luke very much and hungers for him too. And in many ways, their relationship back in the 1980s would be a blueprint of a good, liberal, progressive relationship, don't you think? Working woman, man who cooks, etc. Could read it in that way. But, for some reason, Atwood puts in all these clever little parallels, doesn't she, between the commander and Luke. And that really muddies the water, don't you think? We can't just have good guy Luke, evil, nasty, exploit of the commander, because there are those subtle little parallels which take us into a little bit more of a grey area, don't they? And I think that that is the brilliance of the book. We don't have an easy message, and we don't have easy characters. Our characters are far from being archetypes. And so, do we have a clear message in The Handmaid's Tale? Well, in some ways we do. An ultra-right-wing Christian theocracy is evil and bad in every conceivable way. That's what the book achieves. Look at my board there. That's why feminists and protesters in the United States are dressing as handmaids now, because Atwood created this incredible, powerful indictment of that kind of world. But was the world prior to Gilead perfect? By no means, was it? There were problems there too, weren't there? And we know that after Gilead, when Professor Pixiotto's lecture happens, that there are problems in that society too. So there's no realm of freedom, is there? There's no perfect utopia. But it does seem like history goes in waves of oppression, doesn't it? And that it's cyclical. Thank you for listening.